Good evening. 2020. Can you guys believe that? It's crazy. Just, um, that thing just seems to fly so quick. And possibly, uh, you know, a year that the Lord would, would do some amazing things. And I don't know about you. I, I, I know this um, for myself that it, what, what, would it be cool to be in the presence of the Lord? This year? Did you ever think about that? Just go, man, what would it be like if, you know, I was here when Jesus came back and ripped me out of this place and standing in one moment, you know, in a blink of an eye, you're standing in the presence of the Lord. What, what, what a cool thing that would be. And uh, it, it's going to happen. Just a matter of when is it going to happen, right? And it, and it should be something we long for. It should be something, I, I remember when in, in the book of Philippians when Paul was was kind of debating that whole thing. He goes, look, man, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And he says, no, I, I'm torn between the two because I long to be with him, and yet to stay here is more needful for you. And, and it was, I, I think Paul genuinely was like, man, I would love to get out of here right now. And, and think about all the persecution and, you know, everything that Paul endured and, and his longing and, you know, and, and then, then all the miracles and everything that God was doing in, in Paul's lives. And, and yet his desire was, Lord, was, man, I would love to be in the presence of the Lord. And I think, I think it's really um, the Christian heart. You know, we, we, we all look around and, you know, we got loved ones, we got family that, that we still want to see get saved. We still, you know, in a community that we want to see God work and God move. And part of us is here saying, man, I, 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 I want to I see God touch them. And then the other part of us saying, God, I just want to get out of here. You ever feel that way? And, and here, here, here's the cool thing is, you know, you, you look at this, this whole picture. We're going to look at some prophecy tonight, and I want to look at it from a big perspective, and then we'll talk about some, some, some actual events that are happening that should cause us to kind of take notice as, as we look at these things. But, you know, I, I think from a Christian perspective is as we know and we believe that, that God uh, is in control of everything. He knows the beginning to the end. He, he knows, you know, when all of this is going to go down. He knows when the rapture is going to take place. He knows when the second coming is going to take place, when the abomination of desolation is going to, I mean, he already has it all on his calendar. It's, it's already set. And, and I, I think one of the things that, that kind of blows my mind is, as you look at that is that you, you and I are living in this world and we're on this calendar, but we don't know what that calendar looks like. And, and yet God already has it set. He told the disciples on, on you know, multiple occasions, you know, be ready, watch and be ready. For no one knows the day or the hour of my coming. You know, and so it was just like, hey, live your life in such a way that you're always anticipating my return. And it should be how we live our life. It should be that expectation that we have. There's a passage in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46. God is speaking to the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. It's in the ninth verse, and as he's declaring, and, and I, I think it was a time when the nation was going through a lot of, uh, you know, rebellion and, and, you know, stubbornness, and a lot of issues were going on, and, and God is going to remind them, look, guys, I, I'm in control of all of this. I'm going to read this to you. It's Isaiah 46, 9. It says this, remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there was none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. That that passage, every time I read it, it just astounds me because what what God is telling the nation of Israel is, look, everything that's going to happen, I already know it. I already have it set. It's already determined. It's already going. Even though you and I have a free will and anyone in this world possesses a free will, God is, is so amazing that he... Even with all of that, he knows what it all, how it's all going to play out. He knows how it, what it's all going to look like. And so, so you and I stand back and, and, and we um, kind of look at all of the things going on in the world. And then we take our Bibles and we start to go, okay, what, what, is, what does all that mean? 
What does all this look like? On two different occasions, so it's actually the, the, same, the same study, the, the all of it discourse. It's found in Matthew chapter 24. It's, not, it's found in Luke chapter 21. And in those two passages, Jesus begins to tell the disciples the events that would happen leading up to his coming. And, and, and what, what he would, would tell them is that uh, there, would, there would be events that would transpire, that there would be wars and rumors of wars, that uh, you know, there would be false prophets, that there would be... Um, you know, all kinds of, of, you know, earthquakes and various kinds of signs in the heavens. And, he, you know, he just begins to lay out for them a big old list of things that would transpire. And he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. Another interpretation is that these are the, these are the beginning of birth pangs. In other words, those things are going to happen and they're going to intensify the closer the, the, the event Come, it gets there, right? Just like just like a, a woman in, in 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 labor, you know those 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 contractions go from you know five minutes to two minutes to a minute, you know, and it just it just begins to intensify, not only in frequency but in in strength. And so he says that that's that's what it's going to look like. You're going to see all of these things happen, but it's going it's going to get it's going to get more intense and more frequent the closer we get. And so we 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 know that to be true now. Before we jump into um, some of those uh, events that are taking place, I, I wanted to do the, to, tonight is just kind of take a step backwards and look at God's divine calendar, how, how he said these things would play out. We find that in the book of Daniel chapter 9, and I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible, Daniel chapter 9, interesting passage. Remember what's happening in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel had been taken into captivity as a, as a young boy, a teenage boy, it, it appears. And Daniel um, had been a faithful servant of the Lord. Many prophecies had been given through Daniel, the miracles that, that God had done through Daniel and the ability to interpret dreams. And I mean, just incredible things that Daniel had gone through. But that whole time period was the nation of Israel in captivity because of their disobedience to the Lord. And they were there, and we, find, we know this according to Scripture, they were there for 70 years. Okay, so, so kind of keep that in mind. It was as a result of them not keeping the Sabbath for, seven, for, for, for 490 years, or, or actually it was 390 plus the, the the additional years for uh, the year of Jubilee, but there was, there was a long period that they didn't keep this, the, the Sabbath year. There's a, there, there's, there is a Sabbath day and then there's a Sabbath year that God had instructed the nation of Israel to keep. And for seven, they owed God 70 years that the land would rest. That, that's what it comes down to. And so Daniel realizes that the end of 70 years is about to transpire according to Jeremiah's prophecy. Matter of fact, if you go to verse one in chapter nine, he tells us that, that very thing. He says, um, verse two, in the first year of the reign, of, of reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord according to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So th th this is the setting. That 70-year time period is coming up, and Daniel is fasting and praying, and he's asking God, you know, repenting, you know, asking God to, to you know, forgive them their sins. If you, if you were to read the whole chapter, it, it's Daniel praying. And as you come to verse 27, actually verse 20, we kind of get that uh, an angel shows up by the name of Gabriel, and Gabriel uh, tells Daniel that he, he's going to explain to him what it's going to look like in the future. And, and that, that's what happens there in verse 24. And watch what he says. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Seventy weeks. 
Now remember, they'd just been in captivity for 70 years. And, and what God is, is explaining to Daniel is, look, I still have a, a, a plan. This, this is the calendar that I have for the nation of Israel. Notice what he says. It's for your people, who is, who is the, the Jew, and for who? For the holy city, Jerusalem. And so he's very specific in who this prophecy is concerning. It's concerning Israel the, and specifically the, the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. He says, look, I still have 70 years that have to be accomplished. It's already been determined. I like that word. It's been determined. There's 70 years that are determined that, that, that God is, is going to accomplish. And what will happen at the end of those 70 years? He tells us there in verse 24, it was to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Guys, so what God is telling them is that the, by the time those 70 years are completed, Everything the Bible has declared will have happened. Seal will seal up visions. It'll, 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 it, and all the prophecies that, that, that would happen, they will already be done. And then he says, there's going to be an everlasting righteousness that will be put into play. Iniquity will have been dealt with. Sin will have been dealt with. And then he says, and the Most High, the Anointed One, the Messiah, will take his rightful place in the world, in the kingdom. So, so that, 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 that's what the 70 years is about. It's about the completion of this kingdom, of this world. And the 70 years is, is telling us that when those 70 years are finished, that, it, that everything that you and I know here is going to be finished as well. So that 70-year period is God's calendar. It's, it's kind of like how, how God is kind of keeping kind of everything on its on you know on track it's kind of like this is this is the the goal this is this is this is how it's all going to play out it's a 70 year period now what do you mean 70 years now remember we, we had mentioned earlier in the book of Leviticus oftentimes the bible would talk about a, a week of of days and then there's a week of years and so the nation of Israel were to work the land for 6 years and they were to allow it to rest for one year. They, they, were, they were to labor for six days. They were to rest for one day. God always worked in that, in that format. Now, what, what, what's interesting is if you were to take 70 times 7, you have 490. And so what God is saying is, look, on my calendar, there are 490 years that have to be completed. Then he tells us in that same passage how that 490 years is broken down. Notice what he says, verse 25. Know therefore and understand. Now, anytime the Bible says know and understand, that means, hey, okay, pay attention, right? The Bible says, hey, listen up. It's really what he's saying when, when he tells you, look, he, he, this is something very important for you to grasp. That, that's really what, what the angel is telling Daniel. You know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Seven weeks and 62 weeks. And the question I, I you know, often ask, well, well why, why does he say, why didn't he just say 69 weeks? Seven weeks and 62 weeks. Well, what, 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 what we know happened is it took the first 49 years to complete from the command to go and rebuild the wall and, and, the, and to establish the city of Jerusalem was a 49-year period, which was the, the seven times seven, which was 49 and then there would be another 62 weeks before the Messiah would come, and then he would be cut off. Here, here, here's what's, what, here's what's mind-boggling, guys. 483 years from the time that Xerxes gave the command to go and rebuild Jerusalem 
to the day that Jesus comes riding in on the donkey. To the day it was fulfilled. No, not, not to the year, not to the month, to the day. On a 360-day calendar from the time that Xerxes gave the command to go and rebuild to the time that Jesus comes riding in, in the cult and everyone's throwing the, the palm branches down and declaring, uh, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, declaring him the Messiah to the day. This prophecy was completed. And then two days later, Jesus goes to a cross and hangs. And no, notice what that prophecy declares. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. At the end of the 62 weeks, the Messiah would be cut off. That, that, that's another way of saying that he would be killed or crucified, as we know the events now. And the Messiah would be cut off, and it wasn't because it wasn't for his own guilt or for his own shame. He was cut off, not for himself, but for you and for me and for the rest of the world. And we, we, we know the, 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 the text in, in John three sixteen, famous text, you know, one, one that I think, you know, the, the most popular verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's just, just the gospel in, 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 a, in you know, such a short, concise passage that God so loved the world that he gave his son. He was cut off, not for himself, but for us. And that prophecy, you know, fulfilled. And, and you know, you, you stand back and go, wait, wait, wait what, what does that have to do with, with, with now? What does that have to do with, well, he, here's, here's the deal. The Messiah was cut off and those 69 weeks, remember he said there would be, uh, uh, you know, seven weeks and then 62 weeks and the 69 weeks were fulfilled on that very day. But there was one week that hasn't been fulfilled. And it's referred to as the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. And there's one week that God still is going to be dealing very specifically with the, with the Jewish people and with the city of Jerusalem. That one week, that seven-year period, you and I may have heard that term, the, the, the seven years of tribulation. It's that one final week of world history where God isn't going to be dealing with the Gentiles. He's going to be dealing with the Jew. And you and I are living in this period of grace. We're living in this period where God is dealing not with the Jewish nation. He's dealing with the Gentile world. And over and over again, we would be reminded of that. Jesus in, in Luke's account would say, until the time of the Gentiles is complete. And he was making a reference to, you know, when God's, you know, that finally is finished dealing with the Gentile world, he's going to deal once again with the, the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. It's a grave mistake to go and think that somehow the church has replaced Israel. God's not done with Israel. God is still going to deal with the nation of Israel. He still has one week to work with them, or one seven-year period. In the book of Romans, chapter 11, that, that's, that's what Paul warns. And I, I think it's, an, it's, it's a great passage for us to be reminded. Go back, go, go to Romans, chapter 11. As we're looking at this big picture Book of Romans, the 11th chapter. Watch what he says. Let's start in verse 13. 
Because I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if they being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He goes, look, the, the, the Jews are, are being, you know, they, they're cast away. They're, they're, God's not dealing with them right now. That's what, he's, that's what he's declaring. And then verse 16. For if the fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, that you, you Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do, do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you did not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, watch this, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God and those who fell severity, but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also be cut off. And they also, watch this, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. For you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature. You are grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree. And how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? And then he says, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Till when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And what Paul is declaring is, look, guys, don't start thinking, well, God's cast off the, the, the Jew, and therefore we're the beneficiaries of God's grace. He says, look, the reason they were cast off was because of unbelief. He says, here's the warning. You, you continue in faith. Don't, don't be like them who, who fell into the trap of unbelief. But then he says this. All of that's going to happen. All, God's dealing with the Gentiles until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, there's a certain amount of, no, uh, of, of Gentiles that are going to be saved. God knows the number. God knows the day that that number comes in. He, when the fullness has come in, he says, then God's going to be dealing with the nation of Israel once again. Then the 70th week of Daniel begins to unfold. So we're on a timetable, not on our timetable, we're on God's timetable. And, and so as, as, as we're looking at all, all of these things, you know, you look at that gap between the 69th week and the 70th week, he, he, you know, we, 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 we know that, you know, there, there, there's something of, 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 a, of a kind of lull between those two events, the 69th, the Messiah cut off, the 70th, God dealing with the nation of Israel. Now, we know that at some point there's going to be a covenant that's going to be made. Watch, well, it, it, go, go back to Daniel once again, Ch Daniel chapter 9. Just, well, let's, let's finish that thought there. Look at verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, he says there's gonna be a covenant made for one week. It's believed that the Antichrist is going to be part of that deal that's going to be made. And that's why it's interesting. Every time you hear, you know, that they're trying to solve the Middle East problem between the Palestinians and the Jews, and, you know, every time you, you kind of hear that coming up again, you just kind of like, if it's a seven-year deal, this is good. If it's a seven-year covenant that's going to be signed, that, that, you know, hold on. Start doing your rapture drills. Start jumping in the air in the backyard. Neighbors will really think you're cool. 
Because, you know, you, you, you start to realize that, man, something's going to transpire where the Jews are going to be allowed to once again worship in the fashion that they are accustomed to worshiping according to the Old Testament. They're going to be able to sacrifice again. And in order for them to build their temple, there's going to have to, there, 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 there's, there's a lot of things that need to happen. That's why yeah, every time there's a, a red heifer that's without a blemish, everyone kind of goes, oh, you know, you see, everything we're looking at, guys, when it comes to Bible prophecy and the end times, and these are all events that are going to transpire after the seven year begins. All we're looking at, because we're not looking for the signs, we're looking for Jesus. I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for the temple, I'm looking for Jesus. And, and he, he, here's the deal. All of those things you look at, you start to go, okay, that, that, that could be the things that's going to set it up, right? I mean, you start to look at all the events, that could be the thing that's going to set it up. But we're not going to be here for the event, all we're going to get to do, kind of like, you know, the labor pangs, you know, just kind of like, you know, we, we, you, you kind of see that all these things are happening, like the fig tree. He gives another parable. He says, look, when you see the fig tree beginning to put its figs on, you know that summer's near, right? And, and, and that's really the heart of it. It's, it's kind of like, hey, I start to see all these things coming, you know, the leaves are turning green. That means summer must be close, in that same fashion, you and I are looking at these events going, you know what, if all these things are aligning up and all of the events that the scripture says are going to happen, we're starting to see the beginning of, that must mean that, that it's right around the corner. And that, 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 that's, that, that's what makes what's happening in our world so intriguing and so interesting. Because the events are happening on a scale that they've never happened before. The things lining up that we know the scripture said would happen, you start to see the beginning kind of, you know, signs of those things, the signs of the times, and you start to go, man, you know what? We could be living at the very end of the age. Jesus could be coming back very soon. There's a, there's, a, there's a passage in the book of Revelation. So you just kind of got this idea, okay, the, and, and for the Jew, that, would, that wouldn't have been weird. You know, that, that, that would have been something like, hey, there's going to be a seven, seven you know, year covenant that's going to be made. Then there's going to there's be offer, offer, offerings and sacrifices being made. In the middle of that three and a half year period, that this man of sin, the, the, the man of perdition, the, the, the one who causes the abomination, abomination of desolation, he's going to put a stop to it, right? In the book of Revelation chapter 11, this is what we're told, verse 1. And there was given a reed like the measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they shall tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. 12, 24, 36 plus a half a year, six months, 42 and And what, 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 what's intriguing here again is, is that there's going to be that seven-year covenant that's going to allow the Jews to go and begin to sacrifice at the altar for the first three and a half years of that covenant. They're, they're, all of those things are going to, are going to be in place. And, and it's at that point that the abomination of desolation is going to come and they're going to no longer, they're going to put a stop to the sacrifice. Now, what, what's interesting is that it, it, it's there in... Matthew chapter 24. Let me ask you to turn there. Matthew chapter 24. The beginning of Matthew 24, we're, we're, it, it's, it's the all of it discourse, the, all, the whole chapter, but in the beginning of Matthew 24, uh, all of those things that, that Jesus is saying are going to continue to intensify, uh, he, he explains. You know, nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. The be, these are the beginning of sorrows, right? He, he, he talks about all of those events. And then he says in verse 15, we'll just kind of pull this together here. Look at verse 15. 
Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? By Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Standing in the holy place, let, it, let him, he whoever reads, let him understand. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Guys, th- th- that's important, that Jesus would, would declare that. Because there, there are those who would say the abomination of desolation already happened before Jesus ever came on the scenes. It was during the Maccabee period. And Jesus is declaring, look, that event is something that's still going to happen. It wasn't something that's already happened. Jesus is saying it's something that's yet to happen. And so up, up into that point, well, there are those that will say, look, uh, when, when, when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem and they, and they destroyed the temple, that was the abomination of desolations. Here's, here's the deal. It doesn't describe what Daniel describes here. Daniel said that the, that the one who's going to come is going to surround the city and he's going to destroy the temple. But he was talking about one who would come afterwards. It's, it's interesting how Daniel's so specific in that area. And so you, you, what, what we're looking at is, is there, God still has a seven-year period that he's going to be dealing specifically with the nation of Israel. And you and I are, are somewhere prior to that event taking place. I don't believe the church is going to be here for that event. And I, for, for several reasons. One, because I, I, over and over we're told in the scripture that we're the bride of Christ. And I, I just do not see the bride of Christ being part of the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon the world. I, I, I've never, I, I, just, I just have a hard time dealing with that. For another reason, though, it, go, go back to Daniel. And, and we'll keep your finger here in Matthew 24. We're going to come back. Go, back. go back to Daniel, though. Chapter 12, verse 11. See, there was an 11 somewhere. All right. <laughs> Look at verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomina- abomination of des- desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and you shall arise to your inheritance at the end of, the, uh, at the end of that days. Now, now here, 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 here's, here's, here's the, the point, guys. 1,290 days, another 45 days. That's believed to be the, the judgment time, the great white throne judgment, the, the handing out of, of, the, of the different um, uh, rewards that, that'll happen. That, that's, that's the time when everything's dealt with, the 45 days. But 1,290 days is the coming of the Lord. Now, now here, here's what's interesting. We're told over and over again that no one knows the day or the hour. But when the abomination of desolation takes place and you add 1,290 days, you're going to know when that's going to take place. When no one knows the day of the hour, that, that's a reference to the rapture of the church. That's a reference, that, that's a reference when, when it's going to be a twinkling of an eye and, and no one's going to have any clue of when that's going to take place. We're going to be gone. But we know when that covenant's made, there's going to be a seven-year period. We're going to know three and a half years in that there's an abomination of desolation and it's going to be to the day. And then there's going to be 1,290 days or three and a half years that are going to transpire when, when everything gets dealt with and sealed up. And so... If you're living in the tribulation period, and I hope none of you are here, but if you are, you decided, well, I, I, I'm still going to live my life for me, and I don't care about the Lord, I, you know, and, and, and you know, you have that up, you have that prerogative, and you find out that one day there's thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people gone from the face of the earth, and you realize I got left behind. Here, here's here's what you do: you pull out a calendar, and you start counting off. 1,290 days, three and a half years. Abomination and desolation just happened. And then you start getting your calendar and it's kind of like the Lord's going to come. Now, I, 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 I say that half jokingly because I, I don't know if you're going to be able to hang that long. <laughs> if you read what happens from chapter 7 to chapter you know, 20 of, of the book of Revelation, you know, it's going to be intense. 
But there, there's going to be the ability to know when those things happen because the scripture declared them already. I, I believe all of those references are talking about that moment when we're going to be snatched out of here in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. And so here, here's, here's, here's kind of where, where, where I, I, I kind of put this in, in just, uh, for me, it was kind of revolutionary. I was just kind of like, man, the events are already set. All, 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 everything's already kind of documented. God already determined. These, these things are already in place. You know, all, all of you, you and I are just living this life waiting for that event to take place. And it should be something that, as Jesus encouraged us over and over, watch and be ready. He gave parable after parable, the ten virgins. Five of them had oil, five of them didn't. Because they, they got preoccupied with the things of this world. They, you know, and, and, you know, he, would, he talked about the steward who got left behind and he didn't know when his master was going to return. And so he started drinking and beating the, maids, the, the, the servants. And, you know, he, he just began to live his life for his own pleasure. And he got his eyes off of the master ever coming back again. And I think the whole encouragement for you and I as you look at the events going on, it should cause us to say, man, I, I, I need to make sure that I'm watching and I'm ready for Jesus to come back at any moment. And if, and if, if you walk away from prophecy with that, if you walk away looking at the events of the world with going, man, that timetable's already set. No one knows the day or the hour, but I can tell you, I can see the season. I can, I can see the leaves changing. I see the figs starting to come on the tree. Man, I need to prepare my heart, my life, live it with an urgency because Jesus can come back at any minute. And so with that, we, uh, we, 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 we long for that day, we, 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 we kind of look at the events going on in our world. I, there's a couple of things I, I think that, that, that stand out to me as we're looking at, you know, the events happening in, in, our, in our time. Well, one is th- there is, there is a definitely a rise in anti-Semitism. I, I, and I think it's escalated just every year. We're starting to see a greater intensity of anti-Semitism. We saw just this, this week uh, a, a man went into a synagogue and began to slash with a, with a machete uh, th- those in the synagogue. We're, we're seeing a, a rise of anti-Christ or anti-Christian behavior. We, we, we saw uh, last, last, this last Sunday, you guys watched the news at all, uh, a man walked in with a shotgun and, and thank God there was uh, some security guys uh, that, that were prepared and, and um, two two. Uh, of the parishioners, the, the guys on the security team were, were killed, but they were able to take out um, the, the shooter very, very quickly. Within six seconds is what I understand. We're, we're watching these things. Now, now, what does that have to do with prophecy? Here's the deal. Guys, Satan has always wanted to destroy the Jews. Over and over and over again, we find throughout history, right? There, 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 there's an attack. Why? Because they're God's people. I think anti-Semitism is demonic in its nature. I think it, it starts with the devil, right? And it, it happened with Herod. You know, it, it, happened, it happened before that. It, and, it, and it, you know, the, the, the Holocaust, six million Jews. I mean, you, you just look through history. That has always been a thing. Because devil, the, the devil is the one inspiring that stuff. And London and, and Europe right now, I hear it, it, is, it is at, uh, at a high. Just anti-Semitism is, is and, and, and anytime you're, you know, in a Muslim environment or culture or, you know, a, a majority, that anti-Semitism seems to escalate. And in Europe right now, that's, that's the case. We also know that not just anti-Semitism, but we know according to the scripture that the whole world's gonna turn against Israel. Zechariah chapter 12, verse two tells us this. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people. 
They will lay, lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. It shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people and all who would heave it away will surely be cut into pieces though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Guys, there's gonna come a time when, when every nation is in opposition to the nation of Israel. It's interesting, for, for a while, I, I think our nation was in that, in that category under our last administration. Our current administration right now is very pro-Israel and not only pro-Israel, but has been, um, you know, an against anti-Semitism and making, even in the colleges, they're, they're trying to, to uh, put some laws in place that would, that would discourage anti-Semitism. So it's interesting, you know, you kind of look at that, you kind of go, hey, that, that, that's a positive thing. I understand that that can turn in a heartbeat. I, I think Brit, the Brits are, are also very pro-Israel. I think, you know, there, there's a couple of highlights there. You kind of go like, but, but a, a, a the world as a whole, very anti-Semitic and very anti-Israel. The UN is kind of the, the, the leader in all of that. So just interesting to see what, what, um, what that's going to look like in, in the years ahead or in, in the days ahead. If you're watching the news at all, you, you also know that... Um, Iran has a, has a very real presence in Syria. I, Iran is, it, and, and Iran's goal and, and, and their, their kind of, their, their mantra in life is that uh, they, they, they want to annihilate the nation of Israel and they want to annihilate the United States. And, and they, they, they don't have any qualms about saying that. They very, very vocal when it comes to their desire to see Israel wiped off the map as well as the United States wiped off the map. They call Israel the little Satan. They call us the big Satan. And they are not, not only are they um, taking some roots in Syria, which is the neighbor of, 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 of Israel, but they are, their coalition seems to be growing. Uh, just this week, the, matter of fact, I think yesterday they finished a four-day uh, Navy drill with Iran, China, Russia, as, and there was, there was one more, uh, I, Iran, Russia, China, China and, and I, I, I believe it was Turkey, but I, not, not positive that, but there, there, was, there was four nations that were doing joint drills uh, there in the Indian Ocean, and it was, it was because they believe there's going to be a third world war, and they're preparing for that third world war. So, I mean, you know, you kind of look at that. Guys, Ezekiel chapter 38, we don't have time tonight, but Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us the main players when it comes to uh, that invasion against the nation of Israel. In Ezekiel 38, it, Russia is kind of the, the, the main um, player there. Uh, China, uh, with, with the, the two, 200 million man army, you know, is also kind of, reference there we believe to be part of that but all of the other nations are the muslim nations that surround them libya and and syria and uh the the list you know um iraq and iran and you know persia which which is iran all of that list and it seems like that coalition is is, is continuing to get stronger and russia now has uh, also um got its hands in the middle east and has bases there in syria as well, and so very interesting, you know, as we're looking at these things. See, some of those, and, and Turkey is is all, you know, part of that that coalition as well. And some of those things hadn't been true until until the last, you know, few years. Some of those coalitions hadn't been made uh, up until the last five years or so. And so we're looking at all of that, going, man, you know, all that that's very interesting, you know, that that you know that that's that's actually a thing. I, I, I was reading an article today. Um, it, was, it was on the World Socialist website. On the World Socialist website, this is what it said. Iran, Russia, and China hold joint naval drills in the Indian Ocean amid U.S. war threats. That, that was what I was referring to. But I read this one. Um, Iran, Russia, and the Chinese warships are finishing today a four-day naval exercise in the Gulf of Oman near the Iranian coast of the oil-rich Persian Gulf. 
The exercises marked the first time that Moscow and Beijing sent warships for joint maneuvers with Iran uh, forces in the Indian Ocean. That, that, that was the reference. And, and it's incredible. I mean, th- these things are, are happening as we speak. You know, th- th- this, this, hap- this, was, uh, this was from December 30th, 2019, just yesterday, that they were wrapping up their, 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 pl- their war games. Now, one of Vladimir Putin's top commanders this, this week as well, his name is Valery Gerasimov. He said he believes that the West are preparing for a large-scale military conflict amid a renewed NATO buildup in Europe. He's speaking at a senior briefing for the military, saying that the West has assigned adversary status to Russia. And the general pointed out NATO's summit in London, and he wanted faster deployment to the eastern flanks. NATO and Russia both have shipped tones of military hardware to their frontiers in Eastern Europe. Both regularly accuse the other of aggression over the buildup and General Gershavov warned that this could accidentally spiral into conflict between Russia and NATO and it would spark World War III. And and that's that's kind of, you know, this Russia's top commander declaring that, you know, we're we're preparing, we believe there's gonna be a war, and we believe that this war could lead into you know, a third world war. These are the times that we're living in. And, and then you, know, you, you look at not only those coalitions that, that are happening there, um, Russia uh, is very desperate, and it appears that they're you know, setting up oil fields in Syria, but they want the oil fields. Israel has found great caches of oil off their coast and in their land. And they believe that Russia, because they're, they're financially not doing well, that, that if they go in with Iran and China and Syria to try to overtake Israel, that you know, th- their motivation, and Ezekiel says this, that he would, God would put a hook in their mouth to draw them in. And you wonder if that's not somewhere to play in drawing the nation of, of Russia uh, into this this scenario here. Now, again, you know, one of the things we know from the book of Revelation, remember, everything's leading up to the seven-year period. That, you know, that's kind of where we have all our information at. So we know that in that time, there's going to be one world government and there's going to be one world monetary system. And so, you know, what we're, what we're, we're looking at is you know, how much upheaval is happening in the nations right now, right? It just, there, there, there's a lot of, the, e, the EU's falling apart, you know, with, with now the Brexit the, the, is, is, you know, they're attempting to, to pull out of the Brexit and it's, it's gonna have a great impact upon uh, the, 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 the Euro and the European nations. And, and so the, all of these things are, are, you know, on the table. Uh, as well, and, and you know, with a lot of uncertainty of, of what that's going to look like, uh, and how that's going to look like among the nations. And then, you know, we are ripe, guys, to go cashless. There's going to be a, the Bible talks about the, the monetary system and it being a cashless society. So the Swedes have embraced it full on right now. The, the, the it, computer chips or little chips being placed under their skin is becoming. Um, the trend in, in, in Sweden, and it's been tr- the trend in many companies um, tracking their, their workers, and uh, you know, and the Bible says that you're not going to buy, sell, or trade unless you take a mark. Now, I, I'll tell you, 20 years ago, 30 years when I got saved, I like, what, what you know, what's that going to look like? What does that mean? And, and I'll tell you, anymore, that that's not even a, you know, I think all that's been clarified. <laughs> Right, cashless society is, is we're already primed for it, aren't we? We don't we don't even need cash. You walk around and all of it on your phone already. You got Apple Pay and you know all the different uh, you know Google Pay and you got all, all. I mean, you you and I could, could could live without having cash at all. And yet. Um, one of the things I, I was reading is that the Chinese government is, is um, they, they, they've literally put those chips on the clothing of their students so they know where every student is at all times. You can't ditch anymore. 
Imagine that. I would have had a hard time then. <laughs> you know, so, you know, these things are becoming perfected. They're being used. They're, they're, they're all being put into place. And, and I understand that, you know, true of uh, many different regions, uh, places in India and places, you know, throughout the globe that, that you know, th- these kinds of things are being implemented. And so, you know, we, 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 we know that all of those things are um, kind of something that aren't so far out there that it, how, can you, how can that happen in our lifetime? It could very well happen in our lifetime. It could very well happen on a short order. What does all that mean, right? If we just kind of just, if we, as, as we look at that as a whole, what, what does all that mean? And here's where I want to close. I want to ask you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. We wrap this up. I think Peter gives us a great encouragement there in verse 9. Actually, let, 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 me, let me go back to verse, verse 3 of chapter 3. Knowing this verse, that scoffers will come when? In the last days. They're going to be walking according to their own lust. So they're going to be saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth was standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by that same word, are preserved for the fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Why? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I believe, guys, we're living in the age of grace, but I believe God has been patiently waiting. He's waiting. I thank God for his patience. He's not slack concerning his promises. He's going to fulfill what he said he's going to fulfill, and the timetable's already, you know, in place. I thank God he didn't come back in 1986 before I gave my life to the Lord. Now, when I got saved in 1987, I I was like, Lord, hurry up, right? (laughs) Because I'm only looking at it from my perspective. You know, some of you got saved, you know, after that, 1992 or, you know, 2000 or 2010 or 15, and you're going, man, I sure am glad the Lord didn't come back until I got saved. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, but he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. And, 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 and with that, you know, th- th- think, think about this. God doesn't want one to perish, but there's going to come a day when that last Gentile gives his life to the Lord and the church is going to be taken out of the way. That last Gentile. The number is going to be complete. And then the church is going to be removed. And that seven-year tribulation is going to begin. Uh, you know, all, 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 all of that. And then watch what he says in verse 10. And here, here's where I wanted to wrap it up. He says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved. And look, look at the perspective. He says, look, everything in this world, guys, it's, it's not gonna matter. It's all gonna be dissolved. And if that's the case, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven, a new earth, in which what? Righteousness dwells. Isn't that cool? He says, look, here, here, here's the deal. You and I, because we know this to be true, we live our lives with an expectation. We live a life that's holy. We want to live a holy life because one day Jesus is going to come back. 
And he says, righteousness is going to dwell. Do you remember the end of Daniel chapter 9? He says, he's, when the Messiah, when, when, Daniel, when the seventh week of Daniel is completed, he said he's going to bring an end to sin. He's going he's to bring reconciliation for iniquity. And then he says that righteousness is going gonna, is gonna to reign. He's talking about that day, guys. He's talking about that day when it's finally done. And as a result of it, man, you and I knowing that to be the case, because we know God has a divine calendar that's already set in place, you and I are looking for and we're hastening the day of the Lord. And then we're, you know, with, with all of our heart, man, praying for our moms and our dads and our brothers and our sisters and our aunts and our uncles and our co-workers and our friends. And we're praying that God would soften their hearts. And then we're praying, God, open the door so that I can share the good news that you love them with them. And it should be that kind of urgency that, that you and I have. We look into a whole new year. We're going to a whole another decade, right? We're doing just 2020. And just what does God want to do? And could it be that, that you know, two months or six months or, you know, a year from now that, that all these events are, are, are all going to be unveiled? And if you have that kind of time left, what are you going to do with that time? And we should be living with that kind of expectation, man, that at any moment, our Lord is going to come back again. And am I ready? And have I done everything in my ability to tell everyone I love that he's coming back again?